Welcome to another episode of The Inquisitive Analyst. I'm your host, Marcus Yudikang. It's the show where we chat about business analysis and project management and the challenges and triumphs within those fields. It's very much inspiring, very much informative, and very much inquisitive. My guest today is a prolific international keynote speaker on data analytics. He has more than 35 years experience as a higher education professional and he is a specialist in process improvement. He has filled a variety of roles from business intelligence specialist to senior systems analyst and team lead, as well as chief technology officer. Please help me welcome to today's show, joining us all the way from Raleigh, North Carolina, Dr. Joe Prez. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Marcus. What a kind-hearted and uh, very gracious introduction, sir. It's, um, it's my delight and honor to be with you here today. Thank you, Joe. I, I appreciate that. I have this riveting interest in data analytics, <laughs> and you're the person that I brought on the show today to help answer a few data analytics questions. Absolutely. We should start off with the most obvious of all, how did you get started in the field of data analytics? That's a great question, Marcus. Thank you for asking. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, uh, to, to understand the answer to that question, Marcus, um, we kind of have to go back a little bit further than my immediate career. All right. After finishing my bachelor's degree, I started my first career as an educator in which I stayed for 10 years while earning both a master's and a doctoral degree in secondary education. Hmm. But really, Even before then, I have always, always had an interest in communicating knowledge. Um, I've had a passion for doing so. And a part of that communication and educated education, including uh, includes an an understanding of the educational process. And that entails not only knowing your material, you know, the subject you're teaching, but more importantly, knowing your audience. That's the student to whom uh, or whom you are teaching. All right. And part of that, includes knowing how to make connections with multiple senses of your audience for the learning process. And a major part of that, um, in in doing so, I mean, is doing so in a visually compelling manner. Okay, so that translates really nicely into technology and data, because it takes data to know all these things. This data starting off started off as a side gig during the last six years of my um, career as a teacher. It um, was in the form of my taking increasingly responsible information technology related jobs during the summer months to supplement my teaching income from the school year. Okay, my minor from my master's degree, by the way, was in computers. So, you know, each summer I just kept getting better and better at what I was doing. And well, that spilled over into my running the computer lab at the school during my last year teaching. And then Um, When a computer analyst job at a local university presented itself, well, you know, it was the perfect marriage of technology and education put together. So those summer jobs turned into a full-time second career for me in IT. Okay. As I rose up through the ranks at the university from analyst programmer to computer training manager to business intelligence specialist, All the while, leveraging my communication and instructional design skills by getting to put together all the training programs for my department um, and speaking at university workshops and conferences about all the data analytics reporting solutions that my team was designing. All right. This also ignited an even bigger passion for the reporting of data and analytics, since all of this touches all those hot buttons that I mentioned before, right? And that dovetails into the next phase of my career, the one I'm in now. Um, So after working for 25 years at NC State University in Raleigh, go pack, (laughs) I was recruited away from the university from some really phenomenal people at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, or we'll say DHHS makes it easier. And I'll be honest with you, Marcus, um, they made me an offer that I simply could not refuse. (laughs) You know, it was a major promotion for me. And to be honest with you, 
it was the best possible move that I could ever make, um, both for my career and, of course, more importantly, for my family. And as it turned out, DHHS was looking for someone, excuse me, <clears throat> with both a technical background and also practical knowledge of how processes work, institutions, data, and so forth. They also needed somebody with strong communication skills to bring, know how to bring disparate parties together in discussion. And in addition, another a passion for data and analytics and business intelligence so that this person in this role, namely me, <laughs> would be the catalyst to spearhead the data analytics, analytics initiatives that they were looking to launch. So my current focus, besides data analytics, is project management, maintaining the integrity of our data warehouse, spearheading those business intelligence and data analytics initiatives that we were talking about, and liaising between high-level business clients on one side and high-level technical people on the other to um, come up with solutions that hopefully <laughs> makes everybody happy on both sides. See, I know how people think, again, from my educational educator background, right? Putting the educator thinking cap on. You know, I know how they think. I know how processes work. I understand how learning and communication take place. I understand how data works. So when you put all that together, well, it makes for a very enjoyable work environment in data analytics. Nice. Now, we hear about data. We hear about data. We hear about data. Why should we even care about data? I mean, what's What's the value in using data to help drive business decision making? I'll tell you what, uh, Mark, is that that's um, that's an excellent question. You know, I'm sure that there are many people who have great business acumen. All right. They know their company in and out. They know their processes backwards and forwards. They understand how their business works. Um, you might say that they have great instinct, um, wonderful intuition. Right. Their gut, if you will, is good, really good, very good. And so in these cases, well, the temptation might be to simply follow that acumen, that intuition, that gut, if you will, uh, exclusively when it comes to making decisions, all decisions, business decisions, all scenarios, any scenario, no exception. Now, I got to tell you, there are some abstract value judgments that you might have to make where there may not be clear-cut choices or enough data. So yeah, great intuition absolutely comes in handy there. I'm certainly not advocating that one, that one abandon the use of intuition altogether. On the contrary, your gut is a very valuable tool. Okay. With that said, to the extent that you have data available, and that data can be analyzed, collected, aggregated, summarized, reported on, and so on. You know, that's data from which you can draw valuable insight. So that gut, that intuition needs to be informed in order to be more reliable. See, data, data itself provides a means whereby you can be informed through insight. All right. And after all, it's an, isn't that what insight's all about anyway, right? Um, it, it's a finding that um, contradicts your knowledge, confirms or denies your suspicion, or quantifies how important that knowledge really is. Okay. And then you take it a step further with actionable insight, which is what you're really looking for, because <laughs> it'll either lead you to adaptation and action, or it's going to confirm that you don't need to take any action in the first place, okay? None of this, none of it at all is possible without having data to examine and evaluate. So yeah, that's data-driven decision-making for you. You've got to have it. Nice. So we want deeper understanding of maybe a business. We want to use data to get there, but there's right. so much data. We're inundated <laughs> with data. There's a quagmire yeah. of data. How do we <laughs> sift through this quagmire of data to find exactly what it is that we need? That's an excellent question. Uh, there is quagmire. That's a great way. Um, you know, is it easy? I don't know. Not easy, but it is doable. Um, you know, data overload. <laughs> it is indeed a serious concern. I, I agree 100%. You know, the quagmire. 
especially if you're a researcher. Okay, you need to be more concerned with doing the thing you love, the thing you're good at, good at the research itself, more so than having to be bogged down with all the backdoor behind the scenes data management involved and getting to the the meat of the data. Okay, it's important to have the right kind of data warehouse in place and the right data mining tools that will allow you as the researcher to do just that. One of the tools used at DHHS is a data mining analytics and business intelligence reporting tool called Tableau. Now, <laughs> I'm not going to turn this into an ad or commercial for Tableau in any sense of the imagination, because, you know, there, there are many outstanding tools out there that people can use. OK, uh, this one just happens to be one of the ones at our disposal. OK, so whatever, whatever the brand name of the tool that you might use, OK, you need first a repository in which your data resides, then you need governance and oversight to make sure only authorized people access the data. And again, in, in the scenario I'm painting here, we're, we're talking about you know, private data, our situation at DHHS as an example, right? Health and human services related data, there's going to be a whole bunch of PII related stuff in there. And, and that's generally not public. So you know, this is the scenario I'm painting, all right. Um, let's see, after the repository and the governance, thirdly, there's the infrastructure to ensure that the data can get from point A to point B, right? That would include all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, the ETLs, the data prep, the normalization or the denormalization, as the case may be, um, and, and whatever else might be involved in the preparation of the data. All right, finally. I guess that would be four. Yeah, four. <laughs> you have your business intelligence and analytics reporting platform. Brand name X. OK, <laughs> that's just to keep me impartial. So I won't say Tableau again. All right. All right. So that reporting layer needs to have the capability to allow these researchers that I talked about, right, the ones who really want to get to the data and need to. The ability to pull clearly defined and categorized data elements at a glance into an understandable format, point and click, whatever, uh, in a reasonable amount of processing time, right? They need to be able to ask questions of the data by adding more dimensions, if they wish, by changing the sort order, by being able to drill up and drill down into various hierarchies by changing the way the data is grouped and categorized or giving them the ability to do quick ad hoc frequency distributions so that they can get an overall high level bird's eye view, 10,000 foot, right, the, the big picture. They have to get the lay of the land first and then be able to drill down to the constituent parts of that big picture just to see what fits and what doesn't fit. You know, is there anything that seems out of place? Are there outliers? Are there trends? Are there changes over time or does it seem to be static over time? You know, that kind of thing. All right, these are the types of questions that you need to be able to ask about the data at a high level to gain the understanding that you need and the insight that you're gonna derive. All right, with all these tools in place, all these factors, all the infrastructure, you know, the four things that I said, you know, the filtering out of this quagmire, you know, the extraneous stuff, right, is going to become less and less of an impossibility to the extent that you can have all these other elements already in place first. That's how I see it. Nice. So you've got a company, they've got the repository, they've got the mm -hmm. governance, they've got the priorities, they've got the KPIs, everything that you've listed and more. There is this big gap that I notice between companies that <laughs> want to be data driven and those that are actually data driven. So how how yep. do we sort of bridge this gap? Yeah, there there is there is a gap. That's that's true, uh, Marcus. I I actually give a talk on this very subject, um, and in that talk, my one of my keynote presentations, I encourage people to have a methodology or um, uh, a set of best practices, if you will. I take my audience through what I call the five verbs, okay, the five L's <laughs> to help you from getting to being in data denial to being data driven. Now, there's no magic formula by any means. You know, it is absolutely no silver bullet that's going to guarantee instant results every time or correct results every time. No, uh, I guess you might say it's more like adopting a data driven mindset, okay? Um, 
And it might be to some people, it might be contrary to the established culture or status quo in certain organizations. Nevertheless, I advocate it, um, not to make it too simplistic, but I do like to do things, uh, make things easier to remember. Okay, that's the educator in me coming out, right? So five verbs that I'm talking about. They are look, link, listen, leverage, and learn. <laughs> How's that? Huh? I alliterate it to make it easy. All right, briefly, look. Okay, it's important to start off by looking at the objectives and prioritizing them according to your organization's mission, vision, and goals. Okay. You're looking for that insight that I was talking about earlier, right? Uh, and, and, and deriving actionable insight from it. Okay, that's look. Secondly, link. Uh, after prioritizing those objectives, well, you got to find and present relevant data that links to those objectives. And in my presentation, I encourage the audience to consider the four V's of big data, namely volume, if I can remember, <laughs> volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. We're not going to take time to talk about that, right? You know, you, they, your audience can Google it. All right. Third verb is L, listen. Okay. You start drawing conclusions from that relevant data that you've linked, you know, start listening for the significance of what you've gathered and presented, you know, look for any significant patterns, trends, nuances that give indication of the general direction here. Okay. You have to listen to what the data is telling you, whether it's uh, an upward or downward trend, a statistical fluctuation or a correlation, or maybe none of the above for that matter. You know, all right. Fourth verb, uh, leverage. That is plan your strategy and put what you have available into practice. Okay. With that leveraging comes balance. That is, you have to find the right balance between the planning stage and the execution of that planning. Okay. Lastly, learn. So when you put it all together, after looking at the priorities, linking what's relevant, listening to what the data is telling you and leveraging your strategy, you have to measure success, document what you've done and repeat, learn from it. In other words, learn from where you have looked, linked, listened <laughs> and leveraged. All right. So, um, you know, with that leveraging, um, uh, with the learning, excuse me, you, you can't repeat the process if it hasn't been documented, right? You can't learn from it. And I think about it. If you, if you remember that it worked and you didn't write down how you did it, well, how in the world are you going to know if you can do it again, right? <laughs> if it's documented, it's repeatable. If it's repeatable, it's measurable. And if it's measurable, well, then it can be stacked up against your key performance indicators so you can continuously look for ways to improve each time as you learn. There you have it. Look, link, listen, leverage, and learn. I love this. Look, link, <laughs> listen, leverage, and learn. That's right. When we look at the link part, and this is very important, like you said, making the data relevant, because you can have mm -hmm. all the data you want, but if you can't understand it, if, you can, if it can't be applied, then what's the point of having the data, right? <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and in that data, in that relevance, we've got a different types of data. For example, like qualitative mm -hmm. data and quantitative data. So yes. if we look at qualitative and quantitative data, how are these two opposed to each other? Or are they opposed to each other? No, sir. I don't see them opposed at all. Um, you know, I'll admit they are two different types of data. They're not the same. They are different. Okay. Let's see. Uh, quantitative data is data that can be counted or quantified, the word quantity, right? Qualitative data, on the other hand, looks at attributes and approximations, you know, quality. Quantitative defines, qualitative describes. Um, let's see. Quantitative is objective, aligns with deductive reasoning, while qualitative is more subjective and aligns with inductive reasoning. Okay, so yeah. I, I can see why people would think that they're opposed to each other because they're so different. Okay. Now, while all of this is true, un undoubtedly, I still think you can leverage the two together and you really need to have the two together. You have to, because I believe you can qualify quantitative data. And at the same time, you can quantify qualitative data. Okay. Briefly, um, this is an illustration that I've used in a recent keynote presentation. Um, suppose you owned a sporting goods store and you wanted to keep track of hiking boot sales over time, let's say. 
Now, that's easily quantifiable, right? That can be counted, the quantity, specific number of boots for each day, week, month, you know, whatever period of time you're looking at, right? You can plot that on a graph all day long. Boom, easy peasy. All right. But you can qualify this quantitative data to get more detail, I mean, by asking more detailed questions in, say, a customer survey. OK, in addition to the yes or no questions, right, did you like the boots, right, and the numbers, how many did you buy, you need to determine the extent of your customer's opinions about those boots uh, by asking them to rate the boots, say, on a scale of one to five on several different characteristics, right? So when you do that, you not only get the discrete values that you can plot on the graph, you know, the one to five, right, um, but you also get more depth into your observations and can therefore tease out a more comprehensive picture. Okay, that's what I call qualifying the quantitative. So let's flip it on its side, All right? You can also quantify the qualitative data. Um, to be honest, on the surface, that seems a little bit more challenging, okay? Because you might ask, Oh, wait a minute, how can you quantify something so ethereal and subjective, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. Okay, so how can you take narrative text, for example, and derive some sort of meaningful, measurable pattern from it, okay? You cannot quantify something that has no quantity, okay? <laughs> so again, it's a fair question. Okay, uh, this has been done quite effectively with various types of qualitative analysis software that can read through massive amounts of text and set up a frequency distribution of words that can then be cataloged and you can decide assign discrete attributes you know along a one to five scale of say good to bad or soft to hard you know whatever other uh, contrasting pair that you might derive okay at that point you will then have different categories that you can measure discreetly, right? Based on the choice of those certain key words that were identified and categorized, plotting each one of them, each of the groups, I mean, each of the categories against, say, the number of people in the population who used those terms. You know, that, that'll give you, allow you to gain even greater depth into the measure of the popularity of that particular term or the lack thereof, okay? That's what I call quantifying the qualitative. Now, uh, it may be a bit complicated, but you know what? I never said it would be easy. Neither did you, right? Not easy, but doable. So if you want a comprehensive picture of your data, the best way to do so is to capitalize on every piece of data that you can, both qualitative and quantitative. Nice. Now we have data and used in different businesses. For example, take the government. The government mm -hmm. might ask you specific types of questions that will skew an answer. In other words, you're skewing the data. And right. this is what we call cognitive bias, maybe. Mm -hmm. So That's why correct. is cognitive bias the enemy of big data? Or is it even the enemy of big, big data? Is it the enemy of opportunity within big data? Yeah, excellent. Well, I, I agree. To, to understand that, um, Marcus, it's important to remember something about biases themselves. All right. Um, let's think of biases or biases, however you want to say it, you know, in the plural, right? Whatever. Okay. They make up a grid, right? Through which we all filter or funnel our decision making process. Okay. There's nothing bad about that, you know, it, because in and of themselves, biases are neither good nor bad. They're really neutral if you think about it. OK, they can either help you or they can hurt you. For example, if you are biased about making decisions quickly, well, that can certainly help you if you're in a sinking boat, right? <laughs> but it can hurt you if you're trying to figure out who to marry. OK, it doesn't work that way. All right. See, you know, we, we can't really ignore our biases and simply say, oh, well, I'm not biased about anything at all. You know, that might sound pretty noble. OK, but but you know what? It, it's not entirely accurate. You can't get rid of your biases. You see, I believe a cognitive bias becomes the enemy of opportunity when we allow it to cloud our better judgment. Okay. 
uh, for example, there's the expedience bias in, in which we prefer to act quickly rather than take time. Okay, uh, this one crops up in, in many ways, but, but, but in this conversation, we're, we're limiting it to the context of working with data. That's what we're talking about, big data, right? So when it comes up that you are, say, deciding on a course of action after seeing only one graph, okay, that's where you see this bias rear its ugly head. You, 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 you don't take the time to validate what you're looking at, and you might be led to a wrong decision with faulty data just because the graph looked pretty or the person presenting it to you was pretty convincing, right? Um, the other one is um, the experience bias, okay? That ex that's our tendency to take our own perception to be the objective truth. You know, you can't go outside the box. You know, I've seen that before. You know, that's the way we've always done it. Let's stay within the box, okay? Without taking other valid points of view into consideration. Again, we're in the context of big data now, right? Allowing this bias to have undue influence over our thinking or our um, letting it rain unchecked, so to speak, that's gonna result in our blindly accepting input that agrees with what's already our preconceived notions here without questioning the source, its validity, or its accuracy. You know, there are probably more than a dozen different types of cognitive biases, but, but I think these two will suffice for our conversation today. But, but, but here, here's the point. Okay. Any bias, okay. Any bias when taken to the extreme robs us of the opportunity to make informed equitable decisions based solely upon the empirical, unbiased presentation of the data itself. Again, Marcus, let me stress, we cannot entirely deny our biases, nor pretend they don't exist, okay, nor try to get rid of them. We all have them, let's face it, that's just a fact of life. But the best course of action is to try to mitigate those biases to keep them from exerting too much undue in influence over our decisions. I don't know, maybe by taking action like, um, like pulling in more information um, and reframing our smaller questions in the light of a bigger picture. Uh, in short, ask probing questions about the data. Check your own assumptions at the door. Leave them away, okay? And above all, for pity's sake, do not just take that graph at face value or upon first glance. I like that. Check your assumptions at the door. Yep. Leave your ego at the door. I like that. Amen. Yes, All sir. Right. You got that right. <laughs> now, you gave yeah. an example earlier about buying shoes. And uh -huh. you said as an educator, you like to make things simple. So that was a simple story. Mm -hmm. How can we become better data storytellers? One way is by using the simple example that you did, but are there other ways to become better oh, yeah. data storytellers? <laughs> oh, Marcus, I tell you, I, my, I'm just chomping at the bit for this question because you know you're you're you are you are absolutely uh, speaking to my passion here, Marcus. Uh, okay, I think if we know what makes a person a great storyteller, period, then we're going to know what makes them a great data storyteller, right? So for that, we've got to understand what makes a good story. All right. Think about it. We've been hearing stories ever since we were little kids, haven't we? You know, we learn best as little kids by listening to a good story. See, in every good story. Okay. What do you have? All right. Well, you've got a, a setting. Little Red Riding Hood wants to see her grandma. You have characters, at the very least a protagonist, the good guy, right? Uh, Red and a bad one, an antagonist, the big bad wolf. And then you have a plot. And in that plot, if it's a good plot, you're going to have some sort of conflict. You know, wolf wants to eat red, right? Followed by the ending in which you have a resolution. Hunter kills wolf. Red is safe. Boom. That's it. Nice story. And they all lived happily ever after, right? Uh, uh, character, setting, plot, conflict, resolution. Everything's there. Boom. Anything else is just fluff. It's just the garnish that you put around the meat. Okay. All right. In data storytelling, you also have a setting. Little Red CEO wants to see how her grandma cookie sales are coming, right? You have characters, board of directors who wants to see an improvement and the big bad competition gotten rid of. And then you have a plot. Well, what's in the plot? Uh, the conflict. Bid bag competition wants to eat Red CEO. <laughs> and what's the resolution? Data analyst 
Hunter kills your fear of the competition by showing that grandma cookie sales are going through the roof. The end, they all live happily ever after. Goldilocks doesn't get killed. I mean, not Goldilocks. I'm mixing metacor- metaphors. Uh, what's her face? A little bit writing it. All right. <laughs> okay. If you can take a boring report and underlying graph showing cookie sales and weave it into a relevant narrative with a human interest story behind it that will resonate with your stakeholders uh, or board of directors in this example, right? Giving them something about which they're passionate about. Okay. Well, then what what do you do? Capture their attention, kept their interest, addressed their concern and exceeded their expectation. And you know what? Isn't that what a good story is supposed to do anyway? Right. You have two major objectives. First, you have to incorporate a relevant narrative with a resonant theme. OK, you have both relevance and resonance. You see what I did? Right? Relevance speaks to the mind and tells you the what, while resonance speaks to the heart and gives them the why. OK, lastly, you leave them with a positive takeaway by doing those four things I mentioned. That is capture their attention, keep their interest address their concerns and exceed their expectation. All right. This is my heartfelt passion here, Marcus. I am totally convinced of it. Yes, sir. To the extent that you can stick to this metaphor and ensure that you have nailed your setting, your characters and your plot, the conflict and resolution. Okay. That is the extent to which you will succeed in effective data storytelling. It will happen. I was doing some reading about how to tell good stories recently. In fact, I've been doing that for the last few weeks. And like you said, there has to be a narrative. There has to be a a narrative that can capture and captivate the audience. But most of all, there has to be conflict. If you don't have conflict between good and bad, then nobody is interested in listening to the story. I mean, at the end, good wins, you hope. But there right. has to be that conflict. Yeah, the, the yeah. struggle, the conflict in the middle that, you know, oh, man, is he really going to win? Oh, no. What's going to happen? You know, but, you know, the, 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 the excitement of the moment is there for you when that conflict is present. Yeah. Superb. Now, you've done a lot in your life about data or with data and data analytics. But there's something else you're passionate about, I found out, and that's music. Now, you're heavily involved, <laughs> oh, heavily yeah. involved with music. As a singer, piano player, composer, my big question to you is, how do you juggle the music with the data analytics? (laughs) Oh, goodness. Yeah, music does play a huge part. Yeah, pun intended. Play. Sorry. You know, I'm not so sure I'm all that great at juggling, but, you know, I'm a whole lot better at harmonizing. Uh, Yeah. Again, pun intended. Sorry. But seriously, no, since you, as you already know, I still consider myself an educator, okay? I approach much of what I do in the light of communication with an educator's mindset, an educator's heart. See, I want to make everything an educational experience because I want to ensure that I'm connecting with the people to whom I'm speaking, whether I'm teaching a class, leading a discussion, having a team meeting at work, explaining a data analysis initiative to stakeholders, or giving a keynote presentation at a conference, okay? Um, I long to see the lights come on in the eyes of the people to whom I'm speaking in any and all of those scenarios I just described. I want them to be better off when they're done than they were when they first walked into the room. Okay, that's how strong my tie is to education. You already know that it's what I do and how I do it. All right. Now, when it comes to music, however, (laughs) hey, baby, that's an even bigger deeper physiological connection and emotional connection. I express myself very intensely when I play the piano or sing or compose a song. I was a musician way long before I was an educator. So it literally permeates permeate pretty much everything I do. Whereas the education part of me expresses the what and the how I do things. Mm -hmm. Music, well, (laughs) that's more of the why I do things. You see, I, I see melody. Okay, I see harmony. I see rhythm. I see chord progressions. Um, And and, and just like in telling a story, I see plot or just like a story, a song has a plot. Right. Conflict up and down swings and its resolution, just like you're not going to leave a story hanging. uh, Well, unless it's a cliffhanger on a TV show that you're going to resolve at the start of the next season. Right. 
Uh, but generally speaking, you're not going to leave the story hanging. Okay. In the same way, you do not also leave a chord hanging, say on a on a seventh at the very end of of the song. Okay. See, music is all about following patterns, rhythm, chords that nicely resolve at the end and don't leave you hanging. Hey, Marcus, I see data analytics in the same way. I think my lifelong experience with music has actually helped me to be more adept at recognizing patterns in data, just like there are patterns in music. Okay, the, the, the cyclical nature of a long line chart follows the cyclical nature of the notes on a bass and treble clef put together in a stanza of a song, you know, like stringing together a bunch of arge arpeggios from the woodwind section, okay? The punctuated bursts of an, of an exploding pie chart in your face remind me of the syncopation from the percussion session. The rigid symmetry of a bar graph, boom, 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 Revide, reminds me of the staccato cadence of bar codes in the, in the um, uh, bar chord, excuse me, in the, um, the string section. And then when you put a bunch of uh, graphs together, weave it together into a data story like I talked about, you know, well, to me, it's very much akin to a composer wrapping up his or her work into a beautiful, well-connected symphony for us to hear and enjoy. And just like a musical composition can evoke all kinds of emotions, so can a great data analytics story. So yeah, making your data, uh, make music with your data, I think it fits. Nice. <laughs> now, to use a music metaphor as we've orchestrated this conversation and brought it to a crescendo, pardon the pun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pun intended, I love it. Yes, sir. You got uh, it. Now it's time to bring a retard to it, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, you already got the, re <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's so me. If, no. if I was curious, if uh, anyone wants to get in touch with you, mm -hmm. how's the best way to do so? Um, play me a song. No, <laughs> tell me a story. Right. No, I'll tell you a story. Um, you can reach me via LinkedIn at linkedin.com forward slash I N forward slash J W Perez, or for a uh, more detailed itinerary of my speaking, um, schedule for the for the coming year you can reach me at sessionize.com forward slash joe dash perez if you're interested in uh, someone to be a speaker at your event uh, there you can also see some testimonials what other people say about me um, my bio the topics that i speak about at least the most popular ones along with the learning objectives the takeaways that you'll get from them that's all at sessionize.com forward slash joe dash perez my YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Dr. Joe Perez data. And that's Dr. abbreviated DR. And my personal website is dr. 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 Joe Perez .com. Any of those will suffice. I'm happy to connect with you over LinkedIn. And uh, if you need a speaker for your event, please look me up. I'll be happy to oblige. And I'd have to say probably one of the best data storytellers out there. You are too kind, sir. No, there's a lot of other people out there I can't even hold a candle to, but you're, you're very kind to say that. I'm going to try my best anyway to do the best I can with what I've got and to uh, tell those data stories so that uh, people can get the insight they need from them and catch the same passion about it that I have, hopefully. That's, and I think that's the thing, that when you're, when you're a teacher and you're a passionate teacher and you use great storytelling to capture your audience, then you know, your, your message gets to them in, in the easiest, mm -hmm. best way possible. So, Absolutely. Yeah, and there's and nothing more satisfying, nothing yeah. more satisfying that when you've walked into a room and you've said your speech and you've given your all, you know, you've expended all this energy, you go out of there drenched and exhausted, you know, having given 120%. It's really gratifying to know and to think and to hope anyway, uh, and to see, to get feedback afterwards that people were better off after you left the room than they were when you walked into the room. You know, if you could leave the crowd better off than they were before, that should be your driving force, your driving passion, your motivation as a speaker to do that for your audience more than anything else. Splendid. Absolutely fascinating. I want to thank you, Dr. Joe Perez, for coming on the Inquisitive Analyst. 
It's been exhilarating and exciting and captivating, and most of all, <laughs> inquisitive. Thank you so much, Marcus. It was indeed a joy and a delight and an honor to be on your great show, sir. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. I appreciate it, too. In the meantime, have yourself an absolutely wonderful and exquisite day. Take care. And now a word from our sponsors. The Lewis Institute provides an enterprise project management program that does more than just train PMs. It helps support them from the CEO level on down. These courses help certify project leaders and prepare them to pass the PMP exam. Thank you.